It's another podcast and I'm in another bedroom. I'm making my way all around the house uh, this week, trying to podcast from any which corner I can. I haven't got my man cave. This is like the worst news ever. I'm... <laughs> I'm heartbroken, I've got to say, and joining me on this episode to help me get over the heartbreak and help me take solace in the fact that I am uh, hopping from one room to the other, having to hold my microphone with my hand. What an absolute shambles. Mike Stavery's back with me. Mike, good to see you, mate. How are you? I'm good, man. Have you planned out where the man cave's going to be, though, at least? Or have you got a room designated? So I know where it's going to be. It's going to be built in the garden like the previous one. Mm. But I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it happen in the next month or so maybe a little bit longer which is which is sad because it was my escape pod it was my marriage saver is what i used to call it you know it was my it was my bit of a sort of peace whenever the house got crazy it was my sanctuary whenever my wife's friends would come round <laughs> all of those things and it's gone and the, the the frustrating thing about it is that i still have access to the previous one and it's untouched exactly the way I left it. Mm. And I went there this morning to collect my microphone and a couple of other bits. And it just broke my heart. This podcast started in that man cave. And yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of history there. There is, there is, there is a lot, a lot history of history there. there. There is indeed. Um, how are you anyway? How's it all going? Yeah, good. Thank you. International break. We are just talking before, before we started this, that it's been quite dead, isn't it? In terms of news lines, there's not been much about at all. Uh, on Arsenal, but just in in general. Uh, so, like we said last week, I think just looking forward to having some rhythm back in in the football calendar, and so we can actually get our teeth stuck into some some proper stuff rather than just interrupted all the time, which is really really boring, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this does give us the opportunity to kind of take stock of where we are um, so far this season. Look, we're not in the greatest league position. We're not in the position that we hope to be in, uh, you know, coming out of the back of this, you know, this November international break. We wanted to be a lot closer to the top, if not top of the pile ourselves. That hasn't really uh, worked out the way that we wanted it to. But I think there's a lot of hope and optimism that we can get back on the right track post this international break, put a bit of a run together and drag ourselves back into the title race, fingers crossed. But I thought it'd be a good time to take stock of where we are so far. And I don't want to do one of those season review so far things where we go through every single game because I think we can both agree that there have been some really difficult circumstances for us to navigate as a team throughout this opening period of the season, red cards, suspensions as a result an unprecedented amount of injuries in comparison to, you know, what we experienced last season. So what I thought would be a better idea this time was to go through some of the players. Now, what we've done is we've only picked players for this that have made five appearances for the Arsenal this season or more, because if it's less than that, I don't think that you should be getting a rating, but we're going to rate our players out of 10. We're going to give you some context around those ratings. We're going to share with you our thoughts on some of those players. We'll spend longer on some than others because I think there are more talking points around some than others. Um, but yeah, let's um, let's get into it then, Mike. And let's start with a player that we did a Patreon podcast on just the other day, which you can check out. It's available over on patreon.com forward slash the Chronicles of Aguna. And it's that German guy, yep, Kai Havertz, because he has made a load of appearances at the start of the season. So when we were pulling off the list, he was top of the pile. Um how would you rate his season so far and, and what are your kind of notes for, for Kai Havertz? Yeah, like I said on the Patreon pod, I think it it definitely comes from a point where we were so impressed with him last season, how he turned things around. And he, I think he's kind of become a bit of a cult figure among Arsenal fans because of the Chelsea connection, the poor start he had, how he was ridiculed and to come back from that and be so influential and really nip that conversation in the bud about, you know, do we need a, a, a number nine? Really, you know, shut that down, essentially, uh, when that was the the narrative of, of last season before he kicked into gear. Um, so I think with that sort of background, I think we've been slightly disappointed with his start this season. Obviously, there, there are factors to that. We've spoken about it before in previous pods. The Odegaard's injury forced us to played a slightly different way in more of a 4-4-2 or 4-2-4 with um, him and Trossard playing a sort of dual striker role in a way and, and interchanging a lot. So there are, you know, circumstances to it. Um, but 
And I think we, this is another thing we mentioned when we talk about Havertz, we need to talk about the fact that we've not been able to give him a break at all. Um, he started 15 out of 17 matches, which is pretty crazy. I, I think you'd, you'd agree with that. And, you know, 1,423 minutes, which is a lot of football, really. Um, I think that's the most of, of any player this season, which if you think about the sort of core of players of last season, the ones who played, you know, most league games, if if not everyone, it was Saliba, Gabriel, Ben White, um, the season before, particularly with Ben White, not so much last season. If you think about a forward playing that, that many minutes, it just shows you how reliant you are on him. So overall, I think I've been slightly disappointed compared to the, the heights of last season. Um, I think particularly the last three or four games, he's you, you could see his fatigue. You can see that when he's putting himself about, it's with not quite as much gumption as it as it has been before. And in terms of his goals, you know, seven goals in in seventeen uh, games is not a bad record, really, for for someone who we don't consider as a sort of traditional goal scorer. So, yeah, overall, I've given him a seven, which I think is is solid. It's good. It's it's on the better end. There's definitely some lower ratings here, um, and he's been one of our more consistent performers. Maybe not the the best, though. I would say. I think we're going to agree on this one. There will be some, I'm sure, that we disagree on, but I'm I'm with you. I've given him a seven as well. And I think all of that context is so important with regards to the discussion of Kai Havertz. And, uh, you know, I, I give him a seven with a kind of asterisk next to it, as if to say, I know it's not all on you, which I can't say with some of the other ratings that I'm going to be dishing out during this episode. I think there are a few players that have underwhelmed and uh, deserve to have those lower ratings. I think with Kai Havertz, seven is about the minimum of what I'd accept from him based on what we know of him. Um, and and I do believe that had he been playing centre forward week in, week out this season with the, that structure of Odegaard and Saka on the right-hand side with Ben White joining in regularly and putting the ball into the penalty area, and particularly with his tendency to drift towards the far post, I do think he'd be probably in double figures when it comes to goals, but also uh, impressing a lot more when it comes to the eye test. So seven feels about right for Kai Havertz. If you want some more of that context, as I said already, you can check out the Patreon pod that we did just the other day. I think it came out on Saturday. The link to our Patreon is, of course, in the description below. Right, let's move on to another player. Let's talk David Raya. I'll start with this one, Mike. I've been super impressed with him this season. When we first signed him, there were question marks for obvious reasons. The Aaron Ramsdale discussion just kept rumbling on and on and on and on. And it feels like with Aaron Ramsdale having left the club, it's kind of taken the weight off of Raya's shoulders and allowed him to play with a bit more freedom, with a bit more confidence. He's super confident when coming and claiming crosses, but I think we've seen an increased confidence even with the ball at his feet as well. I think he's been one of, if not Arsenal's best performer this season, when you sort of look at the metrics and you, you, you know, you look at, maybe the journey they've been on as well, where he's come from and where he is today. I'm going to give David Raya a nine. Wow. That's a, uh, we should say how we, we sort of rating it as, you know, 10 is perfect. Nine is incredible. And five is average. Or are we saying like six is average? What, what's well, your sort of thoughts? Given their fogging standards at this club, guys, I want to see my, like a seven is, is a standard for me. Seven like, standard. Okay. Well, se- yeah. If you're below a seven, what are you doing? Yeah. It's not good enough. You know, we want to win the league title. F- got quite a few below seven. So I've got a few too. I've got <laughs> a few too. But Raya gets a nine for me because yeah. I would, go- I would pretty much say that he's been flawless. Like I'm trying to think now if he's had mm. any hairy moments. I think when you play the way that David Raya is asked to play, you'll always get those hairy moments where you try a, an overcomplicated pass or you dwell on the ball a little bit too long. I think even those, he, he seems to have cut them down to a minimum. So nine for me feels like the, the right rating. Yeah, I've gone similar. I've gone eight because I, I think that, you know, the whole debate last season, that's got to be taken into context, context really when we're talking about David Raya because he came through that period similar to Kai Havertz, I guess, and really came out the other side and has been one of our strongest players since then. This season, yeah, I can't think of a time when he's, put a foot wrong really and I think the composure that he plays with is so so important to how we play football and our style and our playing out of the back and making our defenders you know feel comfortable that they're not going to receive a a sort of hospital pass Um, and also he's we talked about it last year as well his variance of um, 
of kicking. He's he's long balls. We haven't seen them as much this season. We've been slightly less direct, I think. Um, but even you know he switches out from from goalkeeper to right back if you you know you want to relieve some pressure and play over teams who, who press you high. It's just it's just unbelievable. And I think he's you know one of the the best with his feet in the league. Uh, you know definitely very close to Edison and, and Allison. I would say who who I'd put at the top. Um, so yeah, I can't really fault him. So eight out of ten for me. There was a clip going around of this outrageous pass that he played for Spain the other night as well. And that's another thing, right? In in Unai Simon picking up this injury that he has at international level, it's opened the door for David Raya. And I'd be very surprised if he doesn't hold on to that number one spot moving forward. Uh, let's talk big Gabby uh, at the back. Love the player. I think he's fantastic. Um, where have you got him on your kind of uh, scale of ratings? So I've given him a seven which hmm. like now feels harsh given what, you, what you've said about sevens. But I think it's about right because I think when we talk about defenders and centre-backs, we talk about partnerships. And I just feel like the last few weeks in particular, that partnership has been strained a little bit. I think because we've struggled so much to to break teams down and we've been lacking so much creativity that a lot is actually put on the likes of Gabriel and Saliba to actually be creative because they have so much of the ball in, in areas more advanced than you'd probably think of them. Like I think in, in some games, I can remember Gabriel almost popping up in like left back positions and even almost where you'd find like a, 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 a the left centre mid because it's like teams are, are doubling up, tripling up on our wingers. So that means that the players that have the most of the ball are, are centre backs a lot of the time or, or, or Thomas party. So um I think with that, that's not necessarily his strength. I think that, you know, when you're asking centre backs to like play, you know, dangerous passes, try and unlock the that's obviously not not what he's been asked to do. But in terms of his defending, I can't fault him too much. I just think there's been some moments where we didn't see it at all last season, but him and Saliba have lost their call a little bit and not has been not been as composed. Um, I think he's been slightly better than Saliba, even though I have given them the same rating, spoiler alert. I think he's been slightly the more dependable one, where Saliba has... Uh, I mean, my theory is that, you know, when I see Saliba without a fresh haircut, I'm like, this guy's not at his best. Because <laughs> he always has a fresh haircut, and there's been a few games recently where, where he's not. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say disappointed with Gabby, but has he been the Gabby of the last two seasons this year? I'm not quite sure. Maybe that's harsh, though. I don't know. It's, a, it's always a hard one to judge um, Gabriel's performances because I always feel like, or at least a lot of the time, he's babysitting a left back that isn't very good defensively. And, you know, at times this season, we've played with Jury and Timber there and that's been fine. You know, we we really pushed him through in the Liverpool game as much as we could, but he had to go off in the end and you saw the difference on our left-hand side when he went. And I, I look at him and I think you are a really, really important part of this team. And... You know, I say that seven feels like the standard for me. I wouldn't say that he's been below that, in my personal opinion. But I can't say he's much higher than that either. So I'm going to give him a seven and a half. I think the partnership has become strained, as you say. I think also the fact that we've lacked creativity is not just, as you put it, asking them guys at centre-back because they get on the ball so much to step forward and get involved in the play. It's also put them in a position where any little one mistake that they make can influence the result. Because if you're not scoring goals, the margins at the back are so small. And you can end up turning up at a place like Newcastle, for example, where we conceded one goal, didn't create pretty much anything, and everybody came away talking about that, obviously, but also pointing the finger at William Saliba and Gabriel for not being as solid as they could have been. And I look back at that goal over and over again, the cross from Gordon, the header from Isaac, it's the perfect cross and perfect finish. Like there's nothing they could do about that. And I feel like maybe our view of Gabriel and maybe Saliba, who we're going to come on to, I'll, I'll slot him in there next so that the conversation can continue. But it feels like with those two, yet yeah, they're not quite where they were last season in the second half of last season, but they're also not a million miles off it. Saliba, you've given him the same rating. What, what do you want to say about him? Yeah, I think you're look, you're completely right. And I think because the, the standards have been so high the last few seasons, we're ultra critical. And because we have dropped off, I think you automatically look and you know judge players' performances in a slightly different way. And any little mistake they make, it's like, oh, okay, that's unusual. I'm not used to seeing that. So when I say 
Saliba has been frazzled. You know, he's still one of the most composed defenders in the league. But when you see him, you know, slightly misjudging things, uh, loose balls, he's not quite getting to. Um, maybe he's half a, a yard off in in terms of pace that usually is. That's for me is a signal that things are not quite right. And maybe that's not down to him as an individual, but it's more the system and how we're playing as a as a team um co- collectively and obviously you know we've got to talk about the the red card as well i think that was that was out of character for him it, and and i know it was difficult because it's a split decision and you know where pundits talking about professional footballers and if we're in that situation probably would do the same 90 percent of the time um and it's hard to criticize him for that but ultimately that was costly and, and i think if you're comparing him and Gabriel, I think that's when I'm going to give Saliba a 6.5 because I think, you know, he's been fine. He's been, he's been good. Has he been as good as the last few seasons? I don't think so. And, and I think that mistake probably is the difference between the six and the five and the seven between him and Gabriel. I'm going to give Saliba this. I'm going to give Gabriel the seven. Did I say that? I can't even remember if I told you. You said seven and a half. I said seven and a half. Okay. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stick with a seven and a half on Gabriel and I'm going to give Saliba the seven because I agree with you. He's been slightly less reliable this season. Um, and and going back to that mistake against Bournemouth, I think that shows you that Saliba isn't at his best level this season so far in the sense of, I think, a fully confident Saliba looks at that situation, stays calm, stays composed and believes in his ability to catch the player up rather than panicking. The fact that he panicked there, the fact that he had a little tug on the def- on the attacker and ends up fouling him, that says to me that William Saliba was rattled. And not in the sense of being mm. angry or frustrated, but in the sense of he panicked. He panicked. Like Even a guy as ice cold as him can have those moments where he panics. And you definitely saw it there. And I think there have been other games where he's not quite been at the level that we know he's capable of. So Gabriel will be my seven and a half and, and Saliba gets my seven. Um, Thomas Partey. I've got to be honest with this one, Mike. When we were working our way through the summer window and everybody was talking about what the midfield was going to look like, I looked at Thomas Partey and I thought, this is probably it. Like his physical power had seemed to dwindle. He, he didn't look as quick across the ground. There were some preseason games where... I've seen Milk turn quicker than he was. And and I was really, really worried about this. But he, along with David Raya, for me, goes into the nine category. I think he's been that good. And he's had to play right back and he's played centre mid. And he's had to, you know, do sort of man-to-man jobs on people at times. I think he's been outstanding. I agree with you. And going back to that conversation in the summer, I think a lot of us wrote him off already. Uh, We were looking at his injury record, uh, how many games he's missed. Uh, his age as well, 31 years old, you know, contracts, contract situation. And we were kind of thinking, you know, this is, he's, he's being, you know, he's going to be replaced by Mikel Marino. I think that's what we all thought was, was going to happen. But, you know, look at the numbers and he's it started 15 out of 16 games across all competitions, 1,317 minutes. I mean, that is a lot of football for, you know, any midfielder really in this, in this team. Uh, let alone someone that we thought was not going to play this much whatsoever. Um, and I spoke about progressive passes uh, last week, and I think that's quite important because we were talking about lack of creativity and lack of you know ability to, to break teams down. And he's got the the highest um, number in the of, of the midfielders and of the of the squad actually with uh, eighty one in the uh, in the sixteen matches played. And I think we've relied on that, and I think actually. Since Odegaard's been out, he's been our most creative player. And it's unusual to say that about a, a number six, but he, he simply has been. I think w- without him, we don't tick. We don't pass the ball forward. It's more sideways. Um, so, yeah, he's been a really, really important player. Uh, surprisingly so. So I've given him an eight out of ten. Okay. He gets a nine from me. So Raya and Partey are my two top performers so far. Yours are Raya and Partey? From, from yep, what you've so, so far. Cool. All right, let's move on. Let's talk Bukayo Saka. He's had some injury issues this season, the type of which we're not used to seeing. 
but he's been hugely impactful when he's played, hasn't he? So where are you putting Bukayo Saka? People have told us for a long time that he's our most important player. I think he's within that group of maybe two or three. But I mean, when he's not there, we suffer, don't we? He's getting my highest rating. He's got to have a nine because I think that game against Bournemouth when we didn't have him or Odegaard, I don't want to say we look like an average team, but we were definitely way, way below what we are capable of. And, you know, the fact that I mentioned this at the time, but that was the first game where neither of them had started since the Brentford one in 2021. And that is mad. Like, I think it's hard to emphasize and overstate how mad that is that when, you know, these two players are the crux of our team, they're the crux of everything that that we've done well under Arteta. Um, and when he's not in the team, I think that's the biggest indication of, of how good he is and how much we miss him. And, you know, stats wise, uh, he's got the most goal involvements across all comps for us out of any players, four goals and seven assists. He's so consistent, so unbelievably consistent. And for someone his age as well to be, you know, not too far away, I would say from, from Mohamed Salah in terms of consistency, it's, you know, it's pretty exceptional. And I think, you know, we can, we can talk about Saka and talk about how great he is, but I think we can all just see it. I don't, you know, you don't need stats to to really, yeah. um, you know, emphasize how how great he is. And you know, I I think my thing with him, and I think we've thought this for a long time, and it's obviously a, a horrible thing to to think about. Is like how long does he stay with us if we continue to miss our, our whoa, target? Whoa, 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 Michael! You yeah, can't but, talk like this, mate. You, you I, can't know, do it. I know. What are you doing? I know, I know, but it, but you think about how good a player he is, and obviously, like that would be a devastating day. And um, you know, we and uh, the the conversation a few years ago when him and Smith Rowe were both coming through was like, oh, like who would you rather sort of leave? And even that felt like a horrible, disgusting situation. But now we're at a stage where Smith Rowe has left, and I know you, you know it's it's a completely different thing because he's not he's not our best or most important player, um, but it should really be something for to kick us into gear and say, look, we need to make the most of this guy. We need to, you know, will there be a better feeling for any Arsenal fan than seeing one of our own um, lifting that Premier League trophy um, so, and so saying, what, you know... What do you, think, what, what do you think then? Sorry to cut across you. What do you think yeah, the on, minimum yeah. is? What's the minimum that Arsenal have to do to keep Bukayo Saka? Because I think we've got some things working in our favor here. The fact that he is homegrown, the fact that he's an Arsenal man, all of that stuff. I know people sometimes want to dismiss that. And yeah, I don't think it's the be all and end all. I think you can fall in love with a player from Timbuktu. You can, you know, you can fall out of love with a player from, from down the road. Like it happens, but I feel like while we're competing for the major trophies, he'll be fine. I, I just worry that if we fall away, like, for example, the way this season's shaping up at the minute, we're in the title race. Well, I don't think we are now, but I think we are capable of getting ourselves back into it by putting a run together. But if we got to the point where even that felt beyond us and completely mm. impossible as such, mm. then I think you start to worry. But I think while you're in the the conversation think you can kind of just go well you know there's next year and he's going to feel like there's something to to play for and something to challenge for i mean i can't see him joining manchester city can't see him joining liverpool does he go abroad like i, I don't i'm not really worried about it right now i wouldn't say i'm worried it's just a, it's just something that occurred to me t- to be honest because mm. i i but you know, as i was sort of eulogizing about how good he is and the the fact is i think he could get into any team in the world like, i don't and i don't think that's like that's you no, know, too hyperbolic. I, f- I genuinely believe he is that good that he could walk into e- like any team in, in world football because, you know, there's not many right wingers that, that are better than him. You know, Liverpool, <laughs> just, I don't want to put this out there, but I'm just saying, you know, if Mo Salah leaves when his contract expires, you know, he is the, the best player that they could get. So I'm not saying that I think he will, but I worry that if we don't meet his expectations, which he must have by now because we've challenged for the title two years in a row, then he will probably be thinking, you know, what's going on? Uh, and I would say, look, if we, uh, and again, I don't want to put this into the, into the ether, but if we, are you going to do it anyway? <laughs> but, gonna, but if we say the way, what happened, you know, what, what you said did happen and we dropped off to the extent where we were challenging for the top four rather than the title. I think, you know, he would have every right to say, 
you know, what direction are we heading in? And that's not to say that he would leave. It's just to say that there might be a thought that pops into his head and, and thinks, you know, I've given so much to this club. I've given so yeah. much to this team. What's next? And that's probably how a lot of players feel. But obviously, we don't like to talk about it because it's very sad. Um, but but look, like going back to the positive part, I just think he's so great. And I want to see him, you know, I want to see his hard work and his consistency rewarded with something. If that's an FA Cup, um, I think that would be enough. I think him, you know, having that feeling of lifting silverware would be, would, would, would be plenty, uh, given that it's been so long since the last one. Okay, you've given him a nine. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to give him an eight. No, no, no. You, you're absolutely right. I just, I just don't want to talk about it. It's like you know, I know, I know, I know. it's like you know, when you've got that friend when you're a kid and you're growing up and you're like, oh, but he's quite cool and we have a good laugh and all of that, and your mum's telling you like. He's a bad influence. Stay away from him. And deep down, you know it, but you don't really want to have that conversation. That's how I feel right now with this Saka, potentially. If I ever see Saka in a Liverpool shirt, I'm blaming you. I'm coming back for you. Um, right. Uh, okay, so Saka's done brilliantly, as he always does. Let's move on to Jurian Timber. I'll start with this one. I've given him a 7.5. 7. And I think I want to give him more. Because I think whenever he's played, I've looked at him and been, oh, you know, like, you know, he's, he's quite good. You know, he, we were missing this player all the last season. And my God, what might have we achieved if he was fit and he was available to help us in those difficult moments? And I, I'm just a little bit confused about the Timber situation, if I'm being completely honest here, right? Because we signed a centre-back from Ajax. Now, it might have always been Arsenal's intention to use him as a right-back. But we've also seen him play as a left-back. And I just don't really know what the plan is for Jurian Timber. I don't know if he was brought in as this like Swiss army knife that can play in all these different positions. And that was the charm. That was what it was that, that we bought into, that we felt made him a really good fit for us. Because I, I worry that he's going to end up becoming a jack of all trades and a bit of a master of none. I love him when you're trying to shut down an area of the pitch, right? So a bit like the way we used Tommy Asu previously against Salah, where you'd go, you're not really my left back because you have limitations when you play in that position. But for this particular game, you're my guy and I'm going to send you out there to do a very specific role and you should be able to do it. The fitness thing, he's had a couple of moments where he's broken down this season. He's missed a few games. I don't think that's uncommon when you're coming back from an ACL injury. So I'm not mm. massively worried about that. But I thought about giving him an eight because I thought of some really good performances. But then something inside me said, no, he's not been that good. Give him a seven and a half. Where are you on, on Jury and Timber? My rating is going to seem really harsh now, but I've given him a six. And that's I don't think that's to do with his ability. I think like exactly like you, and you echoed a lot of what I'm feeling, is that I'm quite confused about his role, where he sits in the team. And even like, I was just thinking as you were talking, does he get into our best 11 when he's fit? Because he's got to compete with Califiori at left back and he's got to compete with Ben White at right back. And I actually don't know the answer to that question. And we, yeah. we might find that out now because if Ben White is out for a, for a sort of extended period, he's going to be the one that's going to play right back, right? So we'll see how do we look when he's in the team? What does his role entail? Because even within these different roles that, that he's played, he's also been asked to do different things. At, at the beginning of the season, he was being asked to invert and play as, as as one of the two sort of, you know, holding players in possession. But recently, we've not been doing that as much. And when he's been playing left back, he's been asked to be more of a, a bit more of a traditional left back, which I don't really think is his strength because a right-footed left back for me always looks a bit strange and it always gives you slightly less options because you don't have that option to go down the outside and you're always yeah. going to be crossing with your with your weaker foot so for me it's less about him and I think he has been good I think he's he what he gives you is that 100% commitment and effort and something that we all like to see and he pairs that really nicely with defensive work plus on the ball uh, skills and I think that is quite rare and he is a bit of a jack of all trades maybe that's something that's almost holding him back because you might say well I want him to be really good at one thing so when he plays in this role he excels in that thing and I think that's you know we've spoken about this maybe something that's holding us back as a team because there's so many options in that defense and so many combinations that we almost don't know what it is that we want to do um yeah so 
yeah, less about him, more about where he's been used. But I think this period now is going to be really important to see if he can establish himself in the team. Because at one point, it looked like he might start a right back ahead of Ben White. But now he's going to be playing there. We'll see what happens. I, I do think, like, before we move on from Timber, I, I do think that the fact that Arsenal have kind of given Ben White the go-ahead to have this minor operation. Now, I know you do get to a point with these things sometimes where you can't delay anymore and it's just got to happen. Right. And I'd imagine that we're at that point with Ben White, because we know in the past that he's been able to play through injury, play through the pain barrier, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think that what Mikel Arteta has seen from jury and Timber has probably been so encouraging when he's played right back, especially that he's kind of gone, well, okay, let's get this over and done with. Let's protect Ben White. We don't need to take a risk with Ben White anymore because we've got this guy who can come in and can do that job mm. just as well. So mm. that's, I guess, the testament to Ben uh, to Jurian Timber, I should say, in itself. What was your rating for Jurian Timber? Mine seven and a half. Six. Six. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Very harsh man you are. Mm. Uh, let's move on. Uh, just conscious of time. Ben White. I'm not going to say too much on Ben White because I think it's fair to say that his level has been slightly below what we've become accustomed to. But a bit like the Kai Havertz thing, although the context is different in that this guy's got an injury problem and he's been carrying this injury problem for a while and it's so serious that we're putting him under the knife to deal with it. I think that I'm going to give Ben White a six and a half, but I'm giving him the six and a half reluctantly because I can kind of understand why he is where he is. What about you? Yeah, I'm at a similar place with Ben White. I think... um it, it does look like he's been impacted by playing pretty much two full seasons and, and not missing a game. And I think that added competition has maybe allowed Arteta to rest him a, a bit more and not be so reliant on him because he knows that there's there's backups there. Not, and ultimately, you know, talks about the drawbacks of having a lot of options in defence, but that is the huge, um, you know, that is a huge positive because previously, you know, in previous seasons, if if Ben White was out and Tommy Asu was out, we'd have to play Cedric at right back in some games. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that that I know, I know that was recently. <laughs> so the fact that 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 Simba can come in now for Ben White is just, you know, that is a testament to the score building and, and where it does flourish. But in terms of Ben White, and we said it last week, I think his role's changed. And I've not seen him being given the license to to push forward as much as he, as he has. And obviously a lot of that is to do with the, the right triangles not been there. Odegaard's been out, um, you know, Saka missed it, missed the game as well. So, so I think that's not had the, the time to formulate. And what Arteta has done is just go a bit more safety first with him and just say, look, we're not at full strength right now. We're committing maybe more players to the attack with Trossard being more advanced mm -hmm. than Odegaard would be. So just stay back a bit. Don't overlap as much as you usually do. So again, I don't think it's, anything to do with him as such, I, th I think it's more more tactical and, and system-based. So I've given him a six because I think he's been similar level to, to Timber. Leandro Trossard. I'll let you start with this one. Leandro Trossard. Honestly, he's a, he's such a weird player, isn't he? Because he's he can be so good and, you know, on paper he might be our best finisher, but it's just this thing with him and I don't know if it's a mentality thing or... Is it because he's not quite been playing at the at the elite level his whole career? You know, he's been at, at good clubs, but not not clubs that have been challenging for for titles. I just he lacks that consistency and he lacks, you know, the ability to be able to produce. And again, he maybe uh has not benefited from this change of, of tactics and being played in different positions, but again, he is a versatile player. Um but when I look at his output compared to last season, you know, two goals and one assist in 15 matches 10 starts for me that's just not that's not where where i see him contributing to this team i see him more as a sort of one in two type of player in terms of goals so he's just been really disappointing i think and you know part of that is down to how do you replace odegaard like it's impossible he doesn't have that same skill set but also just down to his performances have not been at the level that i expect of him so i've given him a five which is might sound harsh but you know, he's not been up to it this season for me. I've given him a four. This might be the only one where I've been harsher than you. Look, I I get it, okay? He's not a false nine. He isn't a second striker. He's been played there quite a bit as we've desperately searched for a solution to Martin Odegaard being absent. But aside from the positional stuff, 
He's just not offered anywhere near enough. His touch is heavy at times. His passing has been sloppy. He looks disinterested a lot of the time, and that really annoys me. And I know that there are some people, my wife would call it a resting bitch face, right? Where, and, and she will be the first to admit that she has it sometimes, right? Where she's sitting there, and I'll look over to her, and I'll be like, what's the matter? And she'll be like, nothing. And I'll be like, why do you look like that? And she goes, it's just my face. So I understand, right, firsthand that there's people, yeah, who – look unhappy at times when they're actually not. But mm. I, th I think at this level of football, body language is so, so important. And I'm just not seeing it from Leandro Trossard at the moment. We brought him into the club under some quite strange circumstances. Mikel Arteta, who booted out people for showing a bad attitude, has gone out and brought someone in who was booted out of Brighton because he didn't get on with the manager. And I, I look at that and I've always had my doubts about Leandro Trossard for that reason. But if mm. we park that side of it and we talk solely about um, his performances, they've just not been good enough. He sold Saliba down the river when he got sent off at Bournemouth and he's made a few other mistakes this season as well that I think have been not unforgivable, but that have really sort of contributed to my my rating of him. So I, I think Trossard, we, we unanimously agree that he's mm. not been at the level. Let's talk a little bit about Ricardo Calafiori. Uh, we'll try and speed these up a little bit, just conscious of time, because there's a few players I don't think of the ones that we got left. That there isn't a great deal to say. Ricardo Calafiori, what have you made of, of that signing so far? How would you rate his start? I've been really impressed. I really like him. I think he's, you know, he pairs that, again, like Timber, that physicality with the, with the technical prowess, which I think... And we've spoken about this previously as well. You know, we have gone more towards the, the physical profile of player and the big, you know, defender and the big central midfielders. Um, but I think when you can do both, that's that's ultimately what what you want and what Arteta ultimately wants, it looks like. Um, so I've been really impressed. Again, he's another player who's versatile. Um, but I think maybe we've not seen enough of him quite yet and we've not seen him in a settled team. Um, so I want to I want to see more of him, and I'm intrigued to do so because I think he's got incredible mentality. Uh, that goal against City was obviously huge. Um, should have ended up being the goal that would that would help us onto a victory. Didn't quite work out that way, but I think maybe that would be he would be viewed slightly differently if he if that did result in a win. Um, but yeah, for me, he's got he's got all the tools to succeed. Again, the the obvious elephant in the room is is his injury history, um, and that is a concern because I think ultimately we've got a lot of defenders now in this team who have had serious injuries, um, have have played a lot of minutes and a lot of football. And you know, if you look at him, Urien Timber with his ACL, and Takehiro Tomiyasu, that is slightly concerning for me. Um, if you're talking about fullbacks from a from a pool of players, who you need to rely on throughout a season. So. Impressed with Califiori, but I don't think I can judge him too much yet. So I've given him a box standard six. Okay. I gave him a seven, um, but I agree with all of your reasoning and I can accept the six as a, as a fair rate. And again, I think it's, we, we, what has he missed? Two stints now with injury. Mm. This one, obviously a bit longer. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's very difficult to judge. I love what he brings the team going forward. I do worry about him a little bit defensively at times. But that's on the manager, in my opinion, to kind of rein him in a little bit if you think he's taking too many risks. I think back to his time in Italy, and I remember uh, there was a conversation uh, that I came across on X between two very knowledgeable people around Serie A. They were discussing whether Calafiori had what it takes to move up to that kind of next level. And one of those people made it, and I forget the name, so apologies, but he made the point that the issue is with Calafiori is that it's great when it works, but there are moments where he makes bad decisions and bad calls. And in the very best leagues and in the very best competitions, he might get found out a little bit with that. So we're going to have to wait and see on him. Um, Gabriel Jesus, I don't think we need to spend much time on this. We've discussed him a lot in recent weeks. I've given him a four because I just think whenever he's had opportunities to start or to come off the bench, he's just not done a single thing for me that would give Mikel Arteta a decision to make when it comes to that centre forward position. I think the gap between him and Havertz just seems to increase week after week. And I don't know if there's a way back for him. So I'm going to give him a four. I'll give him a four for, for the exact same reasons. One goal in 15 appearances, five starts and one assist is 
ultimately not good enough if you are trying to prove yourself as a player that can come in and, and challenge for a starting berth in this team. Um, and even more worrying than that, the performance level has not been there. Um, it's weird because he's got the desire. Like, I don't ever look at him and, you know, you're talking about Trossard maybe looking like he's not bothered at times, but I never get that sense from Jesus. I just, Agreed, I just yeah. think there's something... I think there's something missing there. And and I, from my eyes, from an outside perspective, I think it's a confidence issue and, you know, maybe uh, a, a residual sort of effect of that, of that injury that he had um, and not quite being at his best, but it, it's surprising because, it, you know, we, we spoke about him in preseason and, and said, you know, th- he looks like he's back to his best and for that not to happen is, is quite disappointing. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. You're right about the desire point. I, I was sort of at San Siro a couple of weeks ago up in the gods and that pitch looks absolutely huge from up there. But when he came on at half time, he was chasing everything. He was mm. harrying. He was doing everything within his power, but it just weren't coming off for him. But I don't have any questions about attitude or desire. Let's do uh, Mikel Marino. I'm going to give him a six, Mike, and he would have got a five had he not come on and done quite well at Chelsea in our last game before that I'd have given him a five because I hadn't been impressed one bit I'm not saying that a half of football or not even a half however many minutes it was should change your opinion on this but I have been generally underwhelmed by the signing I haven't felt that our midfield balance has been right without Martin Odegaard full stop and I think that's partly on the manager as well but I'm going to give Mikel Marino a six how have you assessed his uh his first few months as a gunner I gave him a five because I, I think similar to you, I've just been disappointed because I, I'm not sure we've got what I was expecting, and I was expecting someone who brought a lot of physicality, was able to to break up play, um, and also burst forward and and really be a box crasher. Um, and he's not done that really. You know, he's got the one goal against Liverpool, which was an important goal, but it was from a set piece. Um, and yeah, I've just not seen what I, what I thought I would see. So in that sense, I've I've been disappointed. Um, mm. Maybe maybe again, and you know, all the conversations come back to: is this a tactical thing? Um, we know our tech system's complicated; it takes a, a while to adjust to and and really, you know, get up to speed. Um, but I'm hoping to see more because I think we, you know, from the from the money we spent on him and and the profile that he has, uh, obviously mostly with Spain from the summer. I think, you know, we're, we've been left a little bit disappointed. But, you know, again, similar to Califuri, I don't think I've seen quite enough of him. And I, I want to see a bit more before I judge properly yeah. on Marino. We feel a little bit shortchanged at the minute, but maybe that will change. Um, there's a few players on my list that I'm just going to whiz through. We don't even have to give ratings for because they've not really played an awful lot of football. Jorginho is someone who I think when we've called upon this season, he's been very good and reliable. If I was to give him a rating, i put him down as an eight. Because I just think every time he's played, he's been really, really good. And I would argue that when we were struggling with the midfield balance and we were struggling with that creativity in the more advanced areas, we needed to try and tap into what we have in the deeper positions. And especially when Thomas Partey was playing at right back, I felt it was the perfect opportunity to give Jorginho more game time. And we didn't do that. And I'm I'm surprised by that. Um, I'll move on just conscious of time. Odegaard, is there any point in giving him a rating when he's been out for such a long time I don't really think so but I know one that you want to talk about so I want to make sure we get this one in before we wrap up is Raheem Sterling brought into the club during the window at the 11th hour literally on loan from Chelsea it made a lot of sense financially has it made a lot of sense on the pitch so far no I've given him a four out of ten uh I think again like we have to Maybe maybe our expectations were too high, Harry. Maybe we, you know, expected more from him because of his his history and you know his his role in title winning teams at, at City, and we didn't really pay enough attention to his time at Chelsea and how he's been the last couple of seasons. Maybe we overstated what we thought he could do, um, and and maybe w- what his mindset is. I don't know. And I think when we're coming at it from that perspective, it's been a massive disappointment. Um, He's not had the performance levels. Uh, he was chosen to start against Bournemouth in in place of Saka when he was injured. Okay, he came off um, when when Saliba got the red card. But again, I wasn't I wasn't impressed with him on the right. I've not been impressed with him particularly on the left hand side. Um, there was talk of him maybe could he play as a false nine. I don't see that at all. Mm. Um, and generally, just he's just not been up to that level that that we thought he might be. 
Um, and maybe that was a bit too optimistic. I don't, I don't know. But given the deal, you know, short term deal, um, Chelsea are paying paying the majority of his wages. Maybe that should have said something to us yeah. um, about um, about how how highly he's rated um, by them as well. So yeah, disappointing. We expected more. We thought he was going to be the guy to take minutes off Saka, um, but I don't even think he can be you know trusted to deputise for Saka in games where where Saka needs a rest. Um, so that's disappointing, and, and and I think viewing it in that prism is is why we're so you know disappointed really. I've given him a three and it's look, we haven't seen a great deal of him. So it's quite difficult to judge. And we've, we've said that with a few players, but with Raheem Sterling, we know what he is. We've watched him for years and years and years in this league. And we know what he's capable of. Yeah. Of course, his level isn't where it was when he was breaking through at Liverpool and, and the heights that he went on to achieve at Manchester city. But I'm, I'm sort of guessing a little bit here and maybe that's wrong of me to do, but I think, I think something must be up in training. And hear me out here. I think that there's something that Mikel Arteta doesn't like. Is it the way he carries himself? Is it the effort levels? Is it an attitude thing? Have the two of them had a disagreement? I'm not entirely sure, but I just think when you're going chasing for goals in games where you've lacked a spark, you've lacked creativity, you've got this guy who's been there and done it on your substitutes bench and you bring on left backs before you bring him on to try and give you that spark. You bring Zinchenko on before you bring Sterling on. That kind of says to me that Mikel Arteta at this moment in time, and this wouldn't have been the case at the end of the summer when he signed him, but it feels like he's just got zero faith in him right now. And I, I don't know why that is, but reading between the lines, it feels to me like there is more to this because he makes logical sense to be the substitute that you bring on when you need a goal in those wide areas, yet recently he's barely come on. He's barely had a kick. And I, I I think there's got to be something more to that. Just before we wrap, one other player I just want to squeeze in. There's a few that we haven't gone down the road of. We haven't done Odegaard because he's been out for so long. We haven't done Kivior. We haven't done Luis Skelly or Zinchenko. But I do want to give you the opportunity to say something before we wrap up about Ethan Waneri because he has had some game time this season. He has had moments... Um, in the Carabao Cup where he's looked sensational and he's had some cameos in the Premier League. How would you rate his start to the season, bearing in mind that he's 17 years old and all the context around him? So I've given him an eight, which um, feels a little bit harsh. <laughs> I feel like I should be rating him higher. Um, but I think every time I've seen him, he's just been so silky. And I think often when we see academy players, or maybe this is something that we'd say five, six, seven eight, maybe 10 years ago, oh, they look raw. And, you know, you can see the potential. You can see it, but he's not quite there. Maybe the touch is off. Maybe he's not up to speed with the Premier League. I don't have any of them concerns with Ethan Waneri. I think he's so ready uh, given his his age. And I think that is just so rare to see, really. Um, and I think the the frustration with him is that we don't see him more. That, that we only see him brought on. We, he's not started. Um, in the Premier League and I think that's that's what we want to see ultimately and I think when Odegaard was out that was the opportunity to 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 throw him in um, I can understand look, obviously I understand why Arteta wouldn't want to do that because you're replacing you know a player who is our captain who is one of our best players with someone who is a teenager and yeah. you know there's a lot of expectation and weight that that goes on that um, be, being the replacement so I can understand that but I just think I've never never seen a player who looks so ready as as Wanneri for for Arsenal. Even when Saka came in, I thought, you know, he's he's great. He's got so much potential. But let's not forget, he's playing at left back, so I think it was a very different expectations. But for Wanneri to sort of be performing every time he's on the pitch in that position is just so so impressive. And for me, you know, when we're struggling in games and we see him come on. And, you know, we're, we're losing and he's still got that composure. He's still got that quick turn and, and the, the speed of thought. I think that's the even more impressive thing that he doesn't sort of, um, you know, he's not scared of the situation, even when he's been brought on to, to change a game that, that we're losing. Um, and, you know, he hasn't flipped games on, on its head for us in the Premier League, but we've we've seen it in in the EFL Cup in particular. So, yeah, I mean, I can't talk up the guy enough. He, it's so exciting. I can't wait to see him play more. Um, so yeah, eight, eight out of 10 for me. 
Yeah, I gave him the same rating. I, th- I, I think you're absolutely right to say that what he has done, he's done brilliantly. Um, and it's not on him that he's had less minutes than maybe some of us would have liked. But then the other side of it is that cautiousness, um, you know, that you need to have as a manager, I think, when you're dealing with a player like that. And it's not just about the player. It's about all the hype around him as well. Like you've got to manage that so, so carefully because we've seen it so many times. Young players get built up to be the next best thing. The minute they have a setback, everybody lays into them. Everybody says, well, you told us he was the next X or the next Y. And they lay into him. The critique becomes harsher. And not everybody at 17 years old is equipped to deal with that. You know, I think back to when I was 16, 17, I was incredibly immature. I still am now. I don't think I could deal with it now, let alone at 17 years old. So, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a testament to him that he's even a part of the first team setup right now and getting the opportunities that he has. Right, Mike, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you so, so much, as always. Uh, let people know where they can follow you, how they can keep up to date with your brilliant work. Yeah, so I've actually, uh, I'm not on Twitter for the moment because uh, I've moved over to Blue Sky, which uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, but I just wanted like an, a new platform, a new, new sort of perspectives, new new people uh, so yeah, I've moved over to there. It's uh, I think you just got to type in Mike Stavrou uh, on Blue Sky, and you should be able to find me. Guess what? I've just joined it as well. Have about you? Oh, great! Five, about five minutes before we went live on this <laughs> podcast or started recording this podcast, I set it up. Um, I haven't done that whole Twitter posting. Would Elon Musk want you to be posting on Twitter that you're joining another platform? Will those tweets even work with the algorithm now? Who knows? I I just think all these platforms have to be honest have gone to shit haven't they like one is very right wing these days one is going to be very left wing i think i just isn't there just anything that's just a normal social media platform anymore but hey um it is what it is anyway mike thank you so so much as always thank you to you dear listeners for joining us on another episode we'll be back tomorrow with another one and uh, it's not long now till the arsenal are back in action thank god for that just a few more episodes of us waffling before we get back to some real football talk i'll catch you all on the next one take care thank you so much <laughs>